Good morning. The reading today is from Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 to 8. The title is Isaiah's Commission. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Author William Henson writes, I shall never forget my student days at Emory University. After I had served a congregation for a while, I went back to university to study for a graduate degree. I remember being one of the oldest people in the class. And there was another person in that class who had also served a parish for some time. He sat on the other side of the room from me, and we didn't relate to, too well, the two of us, to the younger students because we had our own agenda, our reasons for being there. We didn't also have too much in common with those younger students. And so I remember one day walking over to him. He happened to be a black man. He was the only black person in the class. And at the end of the class, I said to him, how about having lunch together today? That's fine, he said. Where do you want to go? Well, let's try the cafeteria, I said. We went to the cafeteria and enjoyed lunch and began to talk about our churches. He served one of the largest predominantly black Baptist churches in the country. We began to talk about our work, and out of that there grew a friendship, so that the rest of our time we were always together. Toward the end of our studies, he invited me to go home with him one weekend to preach at his church. I gladly accepted the invitation. It was a great church. I was waiting my turn to get up to preach, and he said something in his introduction that got me so choked up that I found it difficult to continue. He said to the congregation, I want you to know that I had set a deadline on the day I met this man. I told God that morning that if I didn't meet one person that day who said hello to me and wanted to spend some time with me, wanted to be my friend, that I was going to give up my education and come back home. And I got all choked up because I still, and I still do, because what I had done was such a small gesture, nothing, let's have lunch together. And out of it, I had not only found one of the best friends I have, but God used that word, unknown to me, as a word of encouragement to him in a time of bleak despair. Isn't it amazing that God can let an imperfect person be an expression of his word of grace? Now, you and I both know that an invitation is a powerful thing. Have you ever been invited? Did someone ever want you to come? Did you ever receive a note in the post or a message on the computer, a message on your phone to come and be part of something you weren't expecting to be? Billy Graham once wrote, I never gave an invitation and nobody came. This morning, I want to invite you to follow Jesus. I want to invite you to do something new, to do something different, something potentially life-changing, to tell your story, to encourage someone to believe. 
In the sixth chapter of the prophet Isaiah, we hear of just such an invitation being issued to a mere man, a person, by a, a mighty and powerful God. In this encounter, Isaiah becomes aware of God and his life is changed completely so that later on he is referred to as one of Israel's greatest prophets. The passage starts, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne. He draws a line in the sand. He attaches the year to the year of a favorite king of Israel. It may sound mysterious and important to you, but really Isaiah chapter 6 is the account of how one man met God. The experience made such an impression on Isaiah that at the end of his career, so many years later, and after he had met so many different people and experienced so many different things, he could still tell you, if ever you asked him, in great detail about that day when he met God, and about how his life from that moment was never the same. It happened like this. It was in that year when Israel's king Uzziah died. Isaiah saw in a vision the Lord high and lifted up, exalted, seated on a throne. And the robe he wore was so magnificent that it looked like it filled the whole temple. And there were angels in that place. They called them seraphs and cherubs. Each had six wings. The place was filled with sounds of church music, beautiful hymns of praise. I even remember the words of the hymn they were singing, says Isaiah. It went like this, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. Isaiah was firmly in the presence of mystery. And when the wow moment had begun to dissipate and the wonder of the sight settled down, Isaiah's attention was turned to himself. Oh my goodness, here I am in the presence of God and I'm a sinner. I'm a sinful man. I'm imperfect. I'm devious. Woe is me, he shouts. I'm ruined. Why? Because he is a sinner, filthy in word, devious in thought and duplicitous in action. Immediately an angel, a seraph, cleansed his mouth, and his sin was taken away. Undeserved, gracious forgiveness. Isaiah's experience of God ended with a question and an answer and then a commission. God says to Isaiah, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah remembers, as surely as apples grow on trees, that emboldened by his fresh forgiveness, he managed to stammer out, here I am. Send me. Is there a day you can remember? Is there a moment you can't forget? Even if you lived ten lifetimes, you'll never forget it. The series of events which opened your eyes to God's presence. What happened to you? And how did your life change on that day that he somehow called you? For each of us, life begins anew the day we meet this God. This God who has always been there, but who, because of the sights and sounds of life, we, have kept, we are kept from seeing. For Nicodemus, it happened on the night he crept out of his house. You remember Nicodemus? John's Gospel? Under the cover of darkness, covering his tracks in case he's found out. Now, you know that little story I love to tell about Nicodemus and about the little girl who went to school and she was asked to write an essay on birth. Birth. So she went home and she inquired of her mother how she had been born. Her mother. Her mother was busy at the time and so she said, Well, the stork brought you, brought you darling, and left you on the doorstep. Continuing her research, she asked her dad how he had been born. Her dad was reading the newspaper and was in no mood to get into the complicated territory of childbirth. And so he deflected the question by saying, I was found at the bottom of the garden. The fairies brought me. The girl went and asked her grandmother how she had arrived. And her grandmother said, I was picked from the gooseberry bush. With this information, the girl wrote her essay. And when her teacher, 
teacher asked her to read it aloud to the class, she stood up and began. There has not been a natural birth in my family for three generations. You see, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, the Council of Seventy, a very important man. He was clearly a person of power and influence, and yet, it seems somewhere deep inside, he knew that what Jesus was saying was true. And so he sought Jesus out in secret. In all Jesus' encounters with people whose lives are about to be changed, we do not find as beautiful a response as the one he gave Nicodemus on that night when Nicodemus came to consult with him. Rabbi, says Nicodemus, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God was not with him. Now this is dangerous talk. The Sanhedrin had condemned Jesus. Now Nicodemus was calling him rabbi, teacher, and a teacher from God as well. Jesus replied not to Nicodemus's introduction, but to the question he had in his heart. I tell you the truth, said Jesus. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now the answer is peculiar, talking of birth to a grown man, but Nicodemus did have an understanding of Jewish proselyte baptism, the way in which non-Jews became Jewish in the time of Jesus with its images of death being plunged under water and resurrection being brought up out of the water again. I am unsure of the reason the image gave him so much trouble. Why did Nicodemus battle with Jesus' idea that you had to be born again? What Jesus is saying is this, Nicodemus, you're going to have to die. You're going to have to have all your preconceived ideas and all the ways you've lived your life, your worldview, your ethics and morals, all of that must be scrapped. As a Pharisee, you've got to put all of that away. And then, Nicodemus, when you are dead, as well as your worldview, and when you know nothing, Nicodemus, only then you must be born again, fresh for the first time, and have a brand new way of living with and of loving God. We need to start something brand new today, dear friends. In your life, you need to begin from square one, from scratch. Only then will you know what it is to inherit eternal life. Only then will you see eternal life. Have you been born again? Are you a new person? For unless you are born from above, and unless you ask God to change your life, to give you a second chance, you will not see the kingdom of God. Jesus taught Nicodemus about the good news, how the Son of Man must come to die, and how everyone who believes in Him will have everlasting life, and how condemnation is really not on God's agenda, but how some will choose light and others dark. It was a hard teaching to learn on that night, and we don't really know how Nicodemus responded. We have no idea whether he believed, but I suspect that there was something in Nicodemus that changed that night. You see, there is no simple recipe for salvation. For as many people who have ever lived, there are stories of how they became aware of God, who fills every place and experience. But there are some things that I can list for you that their stories may have in common. One, there will be a day and a place where you meet Jesus face to face. And from that moment, you will know that he is there. Two, there will be a question for you to answer. I hope you will answer yes. And three, then your life will be totally different. It will be as if you had been born afresh. Let me finish. Paul writes to the Romans, there, are, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the old is gone and the new has come. And when you look at Isaiah's passage in chapter 6, the one that was read for us this morning, you see there is a progression. One, Isaiah becomes aware of God. He sees. Two, 
He worships God. He can't really do otherwise. God is so great. Three, he confesses. I'm sinful, and here I'm standing in front of a holy God. And then four, he receives forgiveness. What happens after that is a question, an answer, and a commission. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, and a challenge was placed before him. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? says God. And Isaiah responds, send me. And every worship experience is like that. We start with praise. We move to confession. We're assured of our forgiveness. We hear God's word to us, the challenge. And then we're given a, an, an offering, an opportunity to offer ourselves. And finally, we are sent out in the world to go and tell. Let me finish with this quote from A. W. Tozer, who's a great minister of a previous generation. You and I are called to an everlasting preoccupation with God. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, as we stand and sit here on this Trinity Sunday, in the wake of Pentecost and the wonderful weekend that we had last weekend, we pray that you would send us into the world that you would give us fresh words to tell the story, and that we would have the courage to speak your truth into every situation. But to see eternal life and to see your kingdom, we must have fresh eyes to be born afresh. Give, a, give us a, a fresh worldview, we pray. For we ask it in Christ's name.